Nickel28 is a nickel royalty and streaming company. They've recently seen a majority of the non-management shareholders vote in favor of removing board members from the company. We'll get more into what's going on at Nickel28 and ultimately what this means for Carbon Streaming, which is a carbon credit royalty company I talk about semi-regularly on the channel. But first, we'll start from where this story begins, at a Cobalt royalty and streaming company called Cobalt27. Cobalt27 IPO'd in June 2017, raising $150 million USD with a share price of around $7 USD. Keep that in mind because it will come up later. With the focus being capitalizing on the hype around electric vehicles at the time. The price of Cobalt had over doubled from its lows in 2016, one year later. The company owned 2,160 tons of Cobalt, worth around $125 million at the time. So this gave them immediate exposure to the rising Cobalt price. Over the company's lifespan, Cobalt 27 had raised over $1 billion in both debt and equity to buy up a variety of Cobalt royalties, including a stream on the expansion project at Voise Bay, one of the largest nickel and cobalt deposits in the world. This would allot Cobalt 27 32.6% of all the cobalt produced at the mine. So this all sounds great. You know, royalties are getting bought up left and right in 2018. Cobalt prices hit an all-time high of around $95,000 per ton. Then they quickly collapsed afterwards. Any astute mining investor knows that the mining industry is incredibly cyclical. So it makes logical sense to just continue to buy royalties if possible. And otherwise, you know, just wait things out until the next bullish cycle comes along. Well, the management team at Cobalt 27 decided against this basic principle. By October 2019, Cobalt 27 had completed the sale of its physical cobalt and the Voise Bay royalty stream to Paula Investments for around $3 USD. So we went from an IPO price of $7 to selling everything for $3 two years later. Now, how did we get here? Now, first of all, any management team that actually believed in their long-term vision would not have taken this deal. This was just horrible timing in general. But the acceptance of this deal centers around the chairman and CEO at the time, Anthony Maluski. I encourage you to read through this compilation of articles from Respeculator on Twitter. But as you can see in the highlighted text on the bottom right, Paul Investments, who was the firm buying Cobalt 27, was already a large shareholder in the company, and the original source of the physical Cobalt that Cobalt 27 had acquired. And additionally, Maluski was previously a managing director at Paul Investments. So Maluski offered his old employer a massive discount for Cobalt they previously owned, and the Voise Bay royalty, which is Cobalt 27's flagship asset. Pair this with massive change of control payments to the Cobalt 27 management team, where Maluski alone was set to get around $7 million. Now this was a huge screw you to investors. They later revised the cash in these golden parachutes down to a more acceptable number, at least, but this was still outrageous. A lot of shareholders were mad about this deal, rightfully so, because they saw another bull run in Cobalt as an inevitability, which to their credit did happen just a few years later. The management team tried to justify all this to investors because the offer from Paula was at a premium to the current depressed share price, and investors would get shares in the new nickel royalty company, Nickel28, which would retain the same management team and have the remaining Cobalt and Nickel assets from Cobalt27. Keep in mind the management team of Cobalt27 I'm referring to includes the CEO of Carbon Streaming, Justin Cochran, who recently announced he was stepping down to executive chair, and the CFO, Connor Kearns. They let this deal happen as well. And they are a part of the management team of Nickel28, so this whole story is connected. So what is going on in Nickel28 now? To be fair, the share price has over tripled since 2019, so the stock hasn't been bad so far returns-wise. The price of Nickel has doubled per ton, even with a recent downturn. Eh, but you know, there's not much going on at the company, just a battle between the company's largest shareholder, Pelham Investment Partners, and the management team for control of the company. Yet again, this management team is in hot water. This whole situation started when Pelham, a New York-based investment fund, approached Nickel28, providing a tender offer for 10 million shares in the company, which, if successful, would have made Pelham the single largest shareholder in Nickel28. Their goal was to bring an independent board that could provide oversight and scrutiny of the management team, who, Pelham was saying, were taking excessive salaries and other forms of compensation. The firm pointed out that Nickel 28 only had two independent directors, when by mandate they should have had at least three on the board. 
Nickel 28's management team rejected Pelham's offer outright, instead hiring a third director of their own only after being called out about it. This forced Pelham's hand. Now they decided to make an offer to existing shareholders instead. At a price of $1.20 per share, Pelham was successful in acquiring nearly 9.5 million shares from existing investors, making them the largest shareholder in the company despite management's efforts at around a 10% stake. After Pelham pointed out that Nickel 28's current board of directors is not independent by any means, they have ties to other companies the management team is working at. You know, instead of appointing new directors, Nickel 28's management team instead just removed their mandate to have at least three independent directors. So they further entrenched themselves to try to bleed shareholders dry instead. And two days ago, Pelham announced that ahead of the votes cast for the shareholder annual meeting in June, 39% of the outstanding shares in Nickel 28 voted to withhold against the current board on a yellow proxy, which is Pelham's version of the proxy vote. They estimate that including the management team's version of the proxy, the blue proxy, over 80% of non-management shares have been voted against the current board of directors. So chances are the current board of directors will get ousted and Pelham can get a new board in to try to bring the executive compensations down at a minimum. So how does all this relate to carbon streaming? It's the same people running all these companies. As mentioned earlier, the previous CEO of Carbon Streaming, Justin Cochran, who's now the executive chair, is the president at Nickel 28, and the CFO, Connor Kearns, is the CFO of Nickel 28 as well. Now, the investment performance of these two companies has been quite different. Carbon Streaming has dropped off a cliff and subsequently never recovered, so this company's been even worse for investors. You know, at least Nickel 28's performing pretty well. But unfortunately, as you might imagine, the executive compensation issues are apparent at both companies. Pelham thought $3.5 million for salaries for a whole year and $2 million in total share-based compensation was bad at Nickel 28. So just look at Carbon Streaming. Several of the same bad actors took $4.2 million in salaries and $1.6 million in share-based compensation. Get this, in six months. They took nearly the same level of compensation in half the time. At Carbon Streaming, which isn't even making much in terms of revenue yet. At least it's more justified in Nickel 28 where they are actually making a net income. But either way, this whole situation is egregious. So let's do a quick comparison between the two largest carbon credit royalty companies by market cap, Carbon Streaming and Base Carbon. Full disclosure, I am a shareholder at Base. So starting out with the compensation, the share compensation between Base Carbon and Carbon Streaming is relatively similar. But look at the salary difference. Base Carbon executives were paid $1.6 million overall the last year. Compare that to Carbon Streaming where executives were paid $4.2 million in total for half the time. Six months. This is hardly comparable. I pointed this out on Twitter, just how outrageous this is. Carbon Streaming executives are making around 2.5 times the salary. They have around 10 times the cash on hand and 10 times as many projects as Base Carbon. Because Base has two, albeit large, royalty projects right now, and Carbon Streaming has 22 royalties in total, with 10 expected to issue carbon credits this year alone. Yet so far, the Carbon Streaming crew have managed to generate around 0.008% of the credits that Base Carbon has, and they bought 2,500 of those credits, for the record, so they only generated 6,200. The Carbon Streaming was established and acquiring royalties before Base was even listed as a company. So if you had the misfortune of following Marin Katusa into carbon streaming, or if you invested on your own, either way, yeah, I truly feel for you. I wish you the best and I hope you're doing alright. But as for anyone else who doesn't have a position, as you can see you should probably stay far away from carbon streaming until there's a new management team on board. Because they have proven that they will bleed you dry through share dilution and eating through the company's cash reserves. So fair warning there. But if you'd like to learn more about Base Carbon, which is a substantially better company, in my opinion, then I will link the videos I've made on the company in the description below. Thanks for watching.